Multicellular organisms start out as a single cell and then begin to divide. All of the cells have the same DNA and the same genes, but at some point, nerve cells, for example, ignore all the genes except the ones that are needed for making nerve cells and become the nervous system. The same thing happens for other organs and body systems. Cardiac tissue ignores all the genes except for those that are needed for the cardiac tissue. This video will discuss how this happens. Gene expression is defined as the process of reading a gene and building a protein that the organism can use. There are two processes, transcription and translation, which are discussed in another video that make this possible. Remember that during transcription, a messenger RNA or mRNA is made from DNA. And then during translation, the mRNA is used to build a protein. The proteins that are made help to determine an organism's phenotype. The phenotype is the set of characteristics that results when the genetic information from a parent is expressed. Humans may have a protein that results in the phenotype of a widow's peak, or a flower may have a phenotype of purple petals as a result of a protein that codes for that color. The human genome consists of over 3 billion base pairs, but a gene is only a few hundred or a few thousand base pairs. So how does a cell only copy the part of the genome that it needs? Upstream, or in front of the gene, is the promoter region. This is a sequence of DNA that is the starting point. RNA polymerase is the enzyme that attaches to the promoter region, along with transcription factors, and is in charge of transcription. Promoter proteins are an example of transcription factors that tell the RNA polymerase to attach to the DNA and begin transcription. RNA polymerase then moves down the gene, making mRNA. The mRNA will leave the nucleus and be translated into a protein. It would be a waste of energy to make proteins when we don't need them. An example is the enzyme lactase, which is only needed when lactose is consumed. Lactose is found in milk and dairy products. The system has a way to turn off or turn on transcription depending on what is needed. There is an enhancer region upstream from the gene which allows certain activation proteins to attach which will cause transcription. There is a collection of proteins making up the transcription factors located on both sides of the loop. Looking at the picture, you can see the promoter region on the bottom and the enhancer region at the top. Activator proteins that attach to the enhancer region bend the DNA into a loop, placing the promoter region opposite the transcription factors. RNA polymerase will start transcription when the transcription factors are connected to both the enhancer region and the promoter region. There is a transcription factor called a repressor that when attached to DNA will block transcription. Regulation of transcription is done by switching off or on RNA polymerase's ability to transcribe. mRNA can be active for minutes to days before breaking down. mRNA is degraded, which renders the mRNA useless and unable to participate in translation. Some mRNA molecules are very stable and can participate in translation for several days. When a cell needs to stop making the protein, not only does it need to not make any more mRNA, but it must also degrade the mRNA that is present. Let's examine the structure of mRNA before we talk about breaking it down. There are protective structures at both ends of the mRNA. At one end is a guanine cap, and at the other end is a poly A tail made of a very long sequence of adenine molecules. The cap is the start of the mRNA and this is important so that translation occurs in the correct direction. There are special enzymes called exonucleases that can remove nucleotides one by one from their extremities, thus chopping up the mRNA. The cap and the tail must be removed first, as the exonucleases are unable to attach to the mRNA until these are removed. The decapping complex, a group of enzymes, removes the cap while the deadenylase complex, another group of enzyme, removes the adenine nucleotides from the tail. Once the cap and the tail are removed, exonucleases can break up the mRNA one nucleotide at a time. They are then reused. During embryonic development, the cells go through a process of differentiation where certain genes are expressed while others are silenced. This allows each cell to specialize. Some cells will become muscle cells and will specialize to contract and relax while nerve cells will specialize in sending impulses. While these cells contain all of the genetic information of the organism, its genome, only a small part of that genome is active. The formation of organs and specialized tissue from undifferentiated stem cells is called epigenesis. Stem cells are covered in great detail in section B 2.3. A human embryo has three layers of cells, the ectoderm, which will form tissue such as the brain and skin. 
the mesoderm, which forms tissues such as skeleton and circulatory systems, and the endoderm, which forms tissues such as lungs and liver. Yeah. There are non-genetic factors that influence the expression of genes, and that is called epigenetics. The process of epigenetics changes the phenotype, but does not change the genotype. These epigenetic factors can originate from outside the organism, environmental stressors, or within the organism's signals from molecules in the body. DNA methylation is when a methyl group, CH3, is added to a DNA nucleotide. This methyl group acts as an epigenetic tag. If the promoter region is methylated, the gene is not accessible to RNA polymerase and the gene will be silenced. This is called transcriptional silencing. Embryonic stem cells are not differentiated and their DNA is not methylated. These embryonic stem cells are considered totipotent, which means they can become any type of cell. Once differentiation begins, methylation begins. Muscle cells will have their DNA methylated except for the part necessary for muscle function. When DNA is copied during embryonic growth, the methylation patterns are also copied. Remember, DNA methylation does not alter the DNA sequence. Only the expression of the gene is impacted. No cell expresses all of its genes, and what genes the cell expresses determines how that cell will differentiate. To better understand this content, it is important that you know the difference between the terms genome, transcriptome, and proteome. The genome is defined as all of the genetic information received from both parents. All cells have a full copy of the genome. There are some exceptions, like red blood cells, as they do not have a nucleus, and gametes, as they only have half the genetic material. While cells typically have all the genetic material, they differentiate and express only those genes necessary for their specialized function. During transcription, the cell produces RNA. All the RNA that a cell makes is called its transcriptome. Because our cells have different functions, for example, our nerve cells will have a different transcriptome than our muscle cells, as they must have different sets of instructions so that they make different copies of RNA, like mRNA. In order to study how cells differentiate, scientists examine embryonic RNA transcripts and the quantity of those transcripts. Scientists will use a process called RNA sequencing. Similar to DNA sequencing, there are online databases that contain RNA codes to allow scientists to compare what they have found with known transcripts. From the DNA, we make mRNA, which has the code for a protein. The mRNA travels to the ribosome where the protein is made. This is called translation. All the proteins that a cell makes is called the proteome. Each differentiated cell has a different proteome, as do the different groups of cells in an organism. One organism will have a different proteome than another. For example, fireflies have a protein that allows them to generate light, while dogs do not. The interest in knowing a person's proteome is that it could lead to personalized medicine. Specific treatments can then be developed for that person. Let's take a deeper look at methylation and the impact it has on gene expression. Methylation can occur in two places. There can be methylation of cytosine in the promoter region, which would then inhibit transcription of the gene, and methylation of the amino acids and histone proteins, which would then affect transcription of the gene. Methylation, when attached to cytosine, will silence the code at the point of methylation. Any DNA sequences containing methyl groups will not be able to undergo transcription. Methylation frequently occurs in the promoter region. These methyl groups are called epigenetic tags and are like light switches, turning transcription off and on. Methylation can also occur in the histone proteins. Remember that histones are proteins that have DNA wrapped around them. This is called a nucleosome and long chains of nucleosomes make chromatin. There are amino acid sequences that form histone tails that protrude outward from the histone complex. Lysine, amino acid, exists in many positions along the tail of a histone, called histone 3, or H3. Depending on where the methylation of lysine occurs, transcription can be silenced or activated. If the lysine located at position 9 or 27 is methylated, transcription is stopped. But if lysine located at position 4 is methylated, transcription will be activated. While you have learned that each amino acid has an abbreviation, lysine is LYS, amino acids also have a letter assigned to identify them. K is the letter for lysine. So we can again say if K4, or lysine at 4, is methylated, transcription is activated, and transcription will be stopped if K9 or K27 are methylated. Methylation works by making the DNA wind more tightly around the histone proteins, 
which makes transcription stop. Activating a gene involves the DNA being loosely wound around DNA so that the gene is accessible for transcription. Because of methylation, phenotypic changes in an organism can be passed on to offspring without a change in the nucleotide sequence of DNA. This occurs when epigenetic tags such as DNA methylation or histone modification remain in place during mitosis or meiosis and then are passed to offspring. Epigenetics can be used for populations as it may allow for adaptation to a gene expression in different situations. It will allow a genome to be applied differently in different situations by either turning a gene off or on. When egg and sperm are produced, many of the epigenetic tags are lost, but some are passed on to the next generation. This means that some of the experiences of the parental organism influence which genes are activated or silenced in the offspring. Epigenetics is fascinating and there are many studies underway to help understand how methylation occurs. One case study is with pregnant Dutch women during World War I. Food was scarce and women who were pregnant did not receive the calories needed for the growing babies. Children born during this time experienced more cardiovascular disease than did their siblings who were born in different years. The DNA methylation patterns were different between the siblings born during November of 1944 and May of 1945 than their siblings born after that time. In animals, epigenetics appears to influence certain behaviors and susceptibility to certain diseases. This may result from experiences of parents and even grandparents. Epigenetic modifications are reversible, and scientists are examining ways to remove methyl groups in order to promote transcription and expression of selected genes. Epigenetic tags can be impacted by where we live and the chemicals in our environment. Air pollution is one example that affects the health of people living in that environment. This pollution can lead to health issues such as asthma, lung disease, as well as heart disease. These include ground-level ozone. Do not confuse this ozone with the ozone that protects us from UV radiation, nitrogen oxide, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and particulate matter and carbon monoxide. Studies examining DNA methylation patterns in white blood cells, brain cells, and other genes that play important roles in the immune system have shown different methylation patterns in the genes of children. These different patterns depended on whether their mother was exposed to high or low amounts of air pollution. There was also a difference in methylation patterns of DNA that controls the formation of the placenta in females who lived close to major roads and thus exposed to more pollution. Children born to females who were exposed to higher levels of air pollution tend to have a lower body mass. The cells of developing fetuses are more susceptible to modification. Primordial germ cells, PGCs, are cells that give rise to sperm and egg. These form during fetal development and have their epigenetic tags removed by epigenetic reprogramming. In order to produce a viable zygote, some of the DNA in developing sex cells is remethylated. Imprinted genes are those that have been silenced in only one of the two copies, either maternal or paternal. This was discovered by scientists who tried to combine the nuclei of two egg cells or nuclei of two sperm cells to produce a zygote. None of the cells developed, even though there was enough genetic material. We know now that the genes from egg and sperm are imprinted differently. Imprinted genes in the egg are methylated differently than the imprinted genes in the sperm. Remember from another video that when genes are not imprinted, there is not a conflict with which phenotype the offspring will have. If the child has the B allele for blood type from one parent and the O allele for blood type from another, the child will exhibit type B blood. With respect to imprinted genes, one of the parent's copy is silenced using methylation and thus the remaining copy will determine the phenotype of the offspring. An example of this is hybrids of lions and tigers. Tigers and lions are similar enough that they can produce hybrids. A female lion and a male tiger produce a tigon, while a female tiger and a male lion produce a liger. The difference is apparent, as ligers can grow to enormous size, over 3 meters long and 500 kilograms in weight. The differences are due to genetic imprinting, and this imprinting is different in tigers and lions. It is thought that these differences evolve due to the different reproductive habitats and lifestyles. Female lions may mate with multiple males. The male lion will pass on genes to encourage growth so that his cub can compete with the other cubs in the litter. The female lion does not have genes to encourage growth as she is related equally to all the cubs and wants to equally distribute resources to increase the number of cubs that survive. Tigers are different in that a female tiger will mate with only one male tiger, 
So both parents are equally related to all cubs. Because there is no competition between cubs, the male does not pass on a gene to encourage growth. So the female tiger does not need an anti-growth gene. If a female tiger, who has no imprinted defenses against the male gene encouraging growth, is mated with a male tiger who will contribute genes that promote growth, a liger is produced and they are much larger than either parent. Twins are one way to examine the effects of epigenetics on gene expression. Remember that fraternal twins, dizygotic, are not genetically identical. There were two eggs and two sperm. Identical twins are genetically identical, with one egg fertilized by one sperm, which then divides and produces two genetically identical offspring. This begs the question that if they have the exact same DNA, why can identical twins be different? We now know that the environment can affect phenotype by affecting which genes are expressed and which are silenced. It is possible to have one twin that is healthy and another who is not. Scientists look at areas along the DNA called differentially methylated regions, or DMRs. When looking at DMRs in monozygotic twins, researchers can compare different methylation patterns to see if disease is connected to these differences. When comparing methylation patterns, there is not much difference in newborns, but as the twins age, the methylation differences increase. Methylation patterns are more similar in twins raised in the same environment than twins raised in different environments. There are external factors that affect the pattern of gene expression, such as hormones and biochemicals. One hormone is insulin, and one biochemical is lactose. Insulin is an important hormone as it regulates blood sugar. If blood sugar rises, insulin is produced and secreted into the bloodstream, causing glucose to be taken up by cells, as well as conversion of glucose to glycogen. This then lowers the blood sugar. Insulin is actively transcribed and translated when blood sugar levels are high. It is the presence of glucose in the blood that triggers transcription of the insulin gene, INS. Transcription factors attach to the enhancer region of INS and allow transcription to begin. When blood sugar levels drop, transcription is stopped. Prokaryotes also regulate transcription. Lactose is a sugar found in milk. E. coli are bacteria that live in our intestines. When lactose is present, these bacteria produce an enzyme called lactase that will digest lactose. If no lactose is present, lactase does not need to be produced as this is a waste of energy for the bacteria.